Welcome to Tony Martinetti Nonprofit Radio coverage of the National Conference on Philanthropic Planning on the Riverwalk in San Antonio, Texas. With me now is Reynolds Caferrata. He is an attorney, a partner in the law firm of Rodriguez, Hori, Choi, and Caferrata in Los Angeles, California, which is a delightfully diverse law firm name. I'm very pleased to uh, welcome Reynolds back to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to have you, Reynolds. Um, your, your topic this year at the conference is coming limitations to the charitable deduction. And you changed it from uh, something that sounded like there might be limitations to something more definitive, the coming limitations. Why are you so certain that we are going to be facing limitations? Well, when I uh, got into really putting together the uh, materials for the presentation, um, looked at the uh, fiscal pressures that the federal government is facing, um, looked at some of the uh, political uh, pressures on other alternatives for revenue, uh, saw that, well, maybe there's some disagreement as to the form. There really actually is, at some level, general agreement between both parties to, um, at some point, limit the charitable deduction. It just looked more inevitable. And so, um, rather than sort of coming in and saying, well, here's things that we can say to encourage them not to limit the charitable deduction, um, I felt the more sensible part of the conversation was to say, uh, here are uh, the things that we need to say in order to um, basically be part of the conversation and structure the limits so that they do the least amount of damage to charitable organizations. What's the history of the deduction? Why do we have it? Um, the the, du the deduction is almost as old as the uh, income tax itself. Um, came in shortly after uh, the code was enacted, and as they raised the rates uh, for World War um, II revenue, uh, they expanded and somewhat broadened the deduction. And it's always basically been for the purpose of encouraging people to uh, make charitable gifts, because. Uh, really, throughout the history of the country, um, our charitable organizations have performed important roles, provided vital services that, in a lot of other countries, uh, at least in some sectors, you know, the government provides. All right, but so why is it under pressure now if it's so valuable to our society? Um, well, because basically uh, everything associated with the federal budget is under pressure. Uh, right now, the um, the Congressional Budget Office is, uh, based on our projected revenue versus our projected expenditures, um, showing a federal debt before the middle of the century that becomes many multiples of our gross domestic product. Um, and as the people in Greece are learning, uh, you know, that's just not sustainable. Um, people won't keep loaning you uh, money uh, to grow a debt in excess of what the country produces every year. Uh, to give some perspective, you know, to finance all of World War II, our um, debt peaked at 109% of um, our gross domestic product. And you get into the mid-century, and if we don't change anything in theory, it would be six times our gross domestic product. That's just not um, sustainable. It's pretty clear, notwithstanding what some politicians say, that uh, you know it's not going to be all done through cuts. We're not willing to accept... Uh, purely cutting the expenditures to get it in line. Mm -hmm. It's going to have to come from revenue. Nobody likes raising rates, so if you don't raise rates, then you have to look at some of the other parts of the code that uh, decrease revenue. And um, the charitable deduction is a sufficiently large um, tax expenditure to make a real difference in these discussions. Okay, so you, you don't think it's a protected sacred cow? No. no. Uh, how much does it cost the government to... Uh, to s essentially subsidize the, the charitable giving in the country? So um, right now it runs um, about $37 billion a year. Okay. Um, and you're, you're finding support on both sides, Republican and Democrat. Yes. Democratic for... for uh, Restructuring the, the the deduction is that a fair way to say it, or uh, are we yes. going to be eliminating I mean, they, it? No. Uh, generally, what people are talking about are limitations on it. Um, the the policy makers recognize the importance of the sector. They recognize the value that it provides, um, and so they don't want to eliminate it completely. But 
they also are generally of the impression that um, they could curtail some of the federal tax benefit, uh, some of the federal subsidy of it, so to speak, and that it's not a dollar for dollar reduction, that they can, you know, gain a dollar of federal revenue and maybe only lose, you know, 20 cents of uh, charitable giving. So uh, it's a trade off that to some degree they're willing to make. I think the one uh, the proposal that gets the most attention is probably President Obama's uh, proposal to limit the deduction for high-income earners. I think those over two hundred thousand who are over two hundred thousand or two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, and and cap that at twenty-eight percent. Do I have those? Uh, are yeah, right? those are basically the uh, figures, and that's the proposal that he's. Um, put out there some of the alternatives to that. Yeah, what else are you saying? Yeah. Uh, the Deficit Reduction Commission was proposing um, changing it to a credit. So instead of taking it as a deduction, you would get a credit against your taxes equal to, with their proposal, 12% of the amount that you gave to charity. So and what, uh, so let's th distinguish between a, a deduction and a credit. So with a deduction, um, let's say you have $1,000 of income and you give away $100. Okay. You then, when you go to compute your taxes, you start out with $1,000 of taxable income. You take that $100 off, you now have $900 of income. You then apply your tax rates to figure out your tax. Okay. Um, so that's how a deduction works. On the other hand, if we had a credit, if you had $1,000 of income, you would figure out the tax that you owed on the $1,000 of income. Then you would go and look at your deduction and multiply the credit rate against that. Uh, and then you would reduce the tax you owed by that credit. Okay. So, so uh, they can, depending on how you structure them, they can sort of economically leave the taxpayer in the same place. It's just a little different way of um, computing things. Okay. Oh, but is it, uh, is it, it can be the same outcome for, for, the, for the taxpayer as a deduction? It, uh, it they can end up, to, if you structure it right, you could in theory end up with the taxpayer owing the exact same amount of tax with a credit versus a deduction. By and large, um, credits are more likely to be beneficial to um, taxpayers at lower rates because it's basically coming off the bottom of that amount of tax they owe, uh, whereas deductions tend to be more helpful to higher income taxpayers because it's a function of their tax rate, and the higher your income, the higher your tax rate. Okay. Um are there other proposals that you're that you're hearing besides those two? Uh, so another one that's uh, out there is to create a floor uh, to say that until your charitable contributions exceed a certain amount, and one of the proposals is exceed two percent of your adjusted gross income, uh, you don't get any benefit, whether it be a deduction or a credit, that you have to exceed this two percent threshold first. And that one's an interesting proposal, because at least based on some numbers that the Congressional Budget Office put out, um, if you put in a 2% floor, that would raise $15 billion a year, almost $16 billion a year for the federal government, and yet it would only reduce charitable giving by $3 billion. Now, that's a hard calculus to know how mm -hmm. people will change their behavior. But, you know, boy, for a congressman, you know, that's, gee, you know, five to one sort of return, so to speak. Um, it's a, an interesting analysis. And that's, in terms of the charitable world, I think that's where uh, we really need to be focusing uh, our efforts is trying to get a better handle on how these different proposals will work. Um, not hiring economists to go out and, you know, give us a justification for saying don't touch the charitable deduction, but hiring them to really honestly, as best they can uh, estimate people's behavior, uh, figure out what these different proposals will do so that we can go to Congress and say, okay, here's the one that does the least harm to us and the most help to you. Um, you know, maybe the CBO is right that it's the um, it's the floor, but um, you know, it may be that there are some issues with their analysis, and a different alternative would be a better trade-off. Now, your session description says that uh, one of your learning objectives is to understand that most arguments in favor of the charitable deduction are lost before they start, and you're sort of we're getting to that topic. You're alluding to it. What what are those? arguments that are such losers from the beginning? Well, one of the, uh, one of the issues is there's at least an, a theory that the charitable deduction uh, is really 
part of the proper definition of income, that an income tax is supposed to tax you on your increase in wealth. And if you, you know, have given the money to charity and you've gotten nothing in return, then you haven't had an increase in wealth, and so therefore that shouldn't be included in your income. Oh. Um, if we could frame the argument that way, it would be you know, much more compelling to say, well, don't limit the charitable deduction. Um, the problem with that is you have a choice. You didn't have to give the money to charity. You could have had the increase in wealth, and so therefore um, you know, it's basically your choice. And so I don't think policymakers are going to buy that argument. So it really puts us in the realm of um, efficiency. And the problem that we basically have is most of the evidence, uh, there are some people who take a contrary position, but I would say most of the evidence is that you could limit the charitable deduction and it's not going to be a one-for-one -one loss in charitable giving for uh, reduction in the federal subsidy. That the tax deduction is part of the reason people give, but it's not the only reason that people give. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's more for the government there than is going to be taken away from the charitable sector, and they're going to look at that efficiency. And there's just there's really nothing, unfortunately, the charitable sector can do about um, that relationship. It mm -hmm. just is what it is. So, what would you like to see the community doing, um, uh, coalescing around one of the alternatives, and and then advocating for that for the the least amount of damage you sort of suggested, or what, what would you like uh, to see? The yeah, charitable? I think there's a a couple uh, parts of the response. One certainly reminding you know uh, voters and the policymakers of the importance of the charitable sector, and that it in this country uh, does substitute and fill in a lot of places where. If it didn't exist, the government would have to provide the services. Uh, we, you know, need to keep that foremost because one of the arguments we're going to have to deal with is, well, you know, uh, we're limiting the mortgage deduction, we're limiting all these other deductions, so we have to limit you too. And it's like, okay, well, that that goes so far, but remember that, you know, when somebody takes the mortgage deduction, you know, they're they're getting a benefit. They're covering the interest at the bank, so they get an economic benefit from engaging in that activity, uh, even if we. Think think it's productive. Same thing with their health insurance deduction. You know, they get health insurance. They get an economic benefit. Um, their retirement plan deduction. They get money in their retirement plan, so they are better off. The charitable deduction is different. They that they don't get any economic benefit out of um, the charitable transaction. So yes, we're in the same boat that we're an itemized deduction, but there's you know an important difference there, and we certainly need to keep that in front of everybody. Um, but then in terms of the analysis that organizations do, I do think that we really need to focus on trying to get some, as best we can, good, reliable data on how donors will respond to some of these different changes. Yeah, how can we possibly gauge this? I mean, there, it's, it's possible for anybody on any side of the argument, either side of the argument, to say this will be the impact on donors, but how can we measure what what will happen under a different set of circumstances? Uh, it, it unfortunately is very difficult, and that's one of the reasons a lot of times when they score tax policy, um, basically that they, everybody knows this isn't true, but they basically, <laughs> score the tax policy as if taxpayers won't change their behavior. Yeah. Um, and the reason they do that is, well, because as soon as you try to guess how they will change behavior, it just sort of opens up a Pandora's box. Um, but we have some empirical data to look at. Some of the states have limited charitable deductions. We could see, you know, some changes in behavior there. Um, you have the be behavior of people who don't itemize their deductions and still give. Uh, so there are some, uh, you know, things to look at and some, uh, you know, measures that economists can uh, go to, and hopefully we can come up with a, you know, some semblance of a reasonable idea of how people mm -hmm. might behave. We may not get the numbers exactly right, but if at least we can figure out that, uh, you know, we don't know whether A or B is going to reduce giving by 5 or $10 billion, but we can fairly safely say that A will reduce it less than B. If we can at least get that analysis, that would be a big help to us. You mentioned an important uh, part of the donor sector to, to keep in mind, which is the people who give and don't itemize deductions. That, that's a fairly large proportion of, of people who give, maybe not the charitable dollars that come in, but do you, do you have a sense of what, what the, that percentage is of people who don't itemize? Um, you know, no, I don't have that figure. Okay. Um, the the other thing that is interesting to look at is also um, the giving patterns of different donors. 
um, people who make a hundred thousand dollars a year or less um, 67 percent of their giving goes to religious organizations um, people who uh, make a million dollars a year or more um, 17 percent of their giving goes to religious organizations and um, their pattern focuses uh, more on healthcare organizations arts organizations educational organizations so in addition to the impact of these proposals on overall giving the other thing we need to look at is well you know does this proposal change behavior more of lower income donors or higher income donors because if you have a fall off of say 10 billion dollars in giving you know just to pick a number mm -hmm. but it all comes from high income taxpayers then that means that's all coming out of you know largely one particular group of tax of charitable organizations versus another group of charitable organizations um, so that's something else we need to look at and see if we can't identify proposals maybe that will be um, more broad-based, or if we can't, then maybe there's some other adjustments we need to make to offset for the disproportionate impact that certain types of charities would bear as a result of the policy change. All right, so someone in a small or mid-sized nonprofit, which is what our audience is, um, what should their steps be to, to try to... Um, join an organization or put their support behind a proposal or what, 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 what's your recommendation? Um, well, presumably uh, organizations like PPP, Council on Foundations, uh, AFP and some of the other uh, big uh, charitable uh, groups will be working on these things and uh, from time to time uh, they will be making appeals to the charitable sector to, uh, you know, write congressmen, send in emails, make contacts, maybe see if they can set up a, a meeting with their local representative and so forth. Um, and certainly uh, smaller organizations may not be able to, you know, contribute a large sum of money, but they can certainly send in a letter. They can, uh, you know, find somebody on their board that maybe uh, has some connection to the local representative uh, and get that message out there. Because mm -hmm. you, be, you can be certain that the interest groups related to the health care, health insurance deduction, the mortgage deduction, the pension plan deductions, uh, you know, that they will have their troops on the hill to um, fight to protect those interests. And so we need to do the same and uh, provide the foot soldiers to do that. And then also the charities need to just keep in mind that whatever the outcome, they still need to be telling their story to people who are committed or to people they think could might have an interest in being committed, to pros donors and prospects, um, because they are still doing important good work. Oh, absolutely. And we don't, don't want this to be a discouragement. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, donor surveys tell us that, uh, you know, the, the tax benefits are number 10 on the list mm. as to why people give. Um, now that, you know, we don't know whether that's partly people giving a, what they consider to be the, the better the answer, right answer to that question. Yeah. Um, but if it's at all to be believed, then uh, we can offset some of the impact of this by a better sale of our better sale explanation of our mission and the important work that we do. Reynolds Cafferata is an attorney, uh, partner in the law firm uh, Rodriguez, Hori, Choi, and Cafferata. I'm sorry you're the last name, but, but it means you're the most recent. You're the youngest, uh, I guess, right? Are you the youngest of all of them? I, I, I am the youngest of the, the partners okay. and uh, joined them uh, later after the firm was formed. And the firm is in Los Angeles, California. We've been talking with him about uh, coming limitations to the charitable deduction and what the uh, nonprofit response ought to be. Reynolds, thank you very much. Pleasure to have you back. Thank you. Real pleasure. Tony Martinetti, Nonprofit Radio. You're listening to our coverage of the National Conference on Philanthropic Planning in San Antonio, Texas.